in the Napa Valley. Everything about this particular winery was world class. I mean, fertile land produced some of the finest grapes that you will find anywhere. Massive wooden vats nurtured and flavored the, the crushed grapes, uh, and it had been in operation for nearly a century. So for decades, people would come, and they would sample, and they would taste, and they would buy some of the, the famous wines from this particular vineyard. Uh, and, but then one season, uh, the tasters noticed just a little twinge of bitter in that, in the wine. They didn't know why nothing had changed, uh, they meticulously followed the same uh, decades-old procedures before, but it was so slight that no one but the tasters could really discern it. But the next year became a little bit more pronounced. And those who enjoyed wine could say something is a little different about this one. By the third year, uh, the visitors began to uh, be fewer and fewer. There's a noticeable dec decline in the orders. And so in desperation, the family, they hire a high-priced consultant. In fact, a whole battery of them from all over the world to discover the reason why the wine's sudden bitter taste. And after examining every aspect of the process, expert after expert after expert came to the identical conclusion. It's the massive wooden vats. They'd outlived their usefulness. They've soured in a way that cannot be cleaned, in a way that cannot be restored. And the recommendation from every single consultant was the same. Replace the vats. But the family was outraged. They're going, those beautiful vats, they have been around longer than some of us have been around. So they desperately had tried to improve the wine apart from uh, replacing the vats. They tried a different fertilizers. They changed the acidity of the ground. They put new labels on the wine bottles. They had new marketing. They hired a new overseer. But they continued to use the old vats. And so the finest grapes in the world were continuing to produce some of the most bitter wine in the world. And sales and bitter visitors plummet. And no one continued to buy the wine except for the family. The family were the only ones. Family knew all that they needed to know to restore the winery to its former glory, but they lacked the courage to implement the strategic changes that were necessary. Now, do you have any idea where I may be going with this? I told you it might be meddling. We have all kinds of biblical examples of changing circumstances that required God's people to change. I mean, think of all of the massive changes that those who were led out of slavery in Egypt on their way to the promised land, think of the changes they had to make. The only life they'd ever known and their parents and their grandparents knew, that life was gone. That was simply being provided for in terms of slavery. Now they're on their own. And then once they get into the promised land, think of all of the changes that needed to happen when the identity uh, revolved uh, of worship and their nation revolved around the temple. But in 722 B.C., the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. Uh, they had to make some significant adaptations. No longer could they do animal sacrifice. And the synagogue was born. And then later, in the earliest years of the church, it was a very Jewish-intensive operation. Think of the cultural and the, and the mental changes that needed to happen as Gentiles began to stream into the church. Changing circumstances require God's people to change. And change, it doesn't catch God by surprise at all. God knows that change happens everywhere, except for the vending machine. So from the very beginning of his earthly ministry, we see Jesus not avoiding change, but leaning into it. He leans into change. When, he, when he's looking for disciples, he doesn't go the typical route. He doesn't go to the seminaries to find disciples and leaders there. No, he goes and he finds the people that the seminarians look down on, blue-collar fishermen and, and evil tax collectors. And then he's got the audacity to party with these disreputables that he's chosen. And the established order, the Pharisees, they're complaining about this kind of change. And so in the scripture that Brett read for us, it's the disciples of, the, of John, they fast and they pray. The disciples even of the Pharisees fast and pray. But your disciples, Jesus, love the party. What's going on there? 
And so Jesus responds, says, you know what? The circumstances have changed. Nobody is sorrowful when the bridegroom is, is in the presence. No, something's changed. And so what Jesus is doing is seeking to help us with this change. And so he speaks two parables that focus on change. Two parables that talk about the relationship between what is old and what is new, between what we should hold on to and what we need to let go of. And the first parable is the parable of a new patch put on old garments. Now, how many of you have had a pair of blue jeans that you just wore through and you want it so badly just to keep them. So you try to extra life. So you put patches on them. But if the patch that you put on those old jeans were new patch, then when you washed them and the dream jeans shrunk again, it, it would rip an even larger hole. And so Jesus is, is saying it's unwise to try and fix the worn through spot of the old with the new. And so pay attention to the relationship between the old and the new. And, and for emphasis, he adds a second parable right on the heels of the first. It's the new wine and the old wineskins. Now, the wine was not fermented uh, in huge vats in Jesus' day. It was a local operation where they would just take a, a, a goat skin and they would use that to ferment. They would pour the, the wine to be fermented in that, and the skin only has enough elasticity to be used once. But if you try to go on the cheap, like I love to do, you were at risk of losing both the skin and the wine, both of them lost. So Jesus is saying, new wine needs to be put into fresh wineskins. The new needs the new. So don't try to put the new in the old. Don't put the new at risk because you want to hold on to the old. It's the wine that's the important part. That's the primary. That's the objective. The skins are secondary. They're, they're meant to be temporal with a one-time use. So don't try to hold on to what by design is meant to be temporary. And so what Jesus is seeking to do is to help us to distinguish between the core of that which we should always hold on to and never let go, to, to distinguish from that what is temporary and what we are supposed to let go of. So Jesus says some things must never change. They must never change. They are the essential core. When once Jesus was asked, what's the most important commandment of the Bible? Is there one that rises above all the others? He said, that's easy. He said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, with all your strength. Love your neighbors yourself. That's core. That must never change. It's not open to adjustment based on cultural whims. So let culture change however it will. That should never change. It's essential. And even the Pharisees agreed with Jesus on this. So some things must never change and we must hold on to them. But Jesus said, on the other hand, some things must remain flexible. They must change. Whatever is cultural, whatever is secondary, whatever is meant to be temporary, it needs to be let go of. Because God loves the new to go in the new. God is a God of new. God is a God of fresh. God is a God of change. In whatever is not core, He loves to change it up. And that's why you have in the Bible the command to sing a new song, the command to have a new heart, the command that He will give you a, a new spirit. Embrace the new covenant. You're a new creation. The new birth. There is a new commandment. I'm making a new heavens and the earth. And I make all things new is one of the final statements of the Bible in the book of Revelation. And the reason God does that, He's so creative. He is so creative. He loves variety. Listen, church. God loves variety. Now, I don't know if you, you could probably push this too far, but there's something that I, I came across this week that I thought, I've never heard that taught before. There's a phrase in the Bible, it's called the way of God, the way of the Lord. But it's outnumbered by the, a phrase, the ways of the Lord, singular and plural. So Jesus said, I am the way, 
the truth and the life, one way. That's it. One way to God the Father, and that's never going to change. But that's outnumbered by many of the scores of times where it says the ways of the Lord. The ways of the Lord. David prays in Psalm 25, uh, make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths, plural. Like there's, there's variety. There's so much that you have. Um, he made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the sons of Israel. God loves variety. So there's more than one way that God will work out his ultimate unchanging plan and purpose and design. So for instance, when his people need sustenance, food, he does it in a whole variety of ways. A manna is what one generation gets. The multiplication of fish and loaves in an entirely different setting. He'll use ravens that will fly in some bread to the prophet Elijah in, in a season of drought. He, he multiplies the widow's provisions for the prophet. There's a whole variety of ways. God loves variety. Look at the variety of ways that Jesus healed people. He touched some. He spoke from a distance and healed others. Other people touched him and were healed. And this is the, the, the great scripture of every junior high boy. He spit in the ground and made some mud, slapped it on some guy's eyeballs. Man, that's what I call variety. He gave authority to the disciples, and the disciples healed people. He told some lepers, you go see the priest, and you'll be healed on the way. There's a whole variety of how God does this, the ways of God. It's as if God is saying, I refuse to do today's miracles in yesterday's ways. So the non-essentials. We've got a God who revels in the new and the creative. So what is core and essential, that does not change. And it should not change. And yet sometimes, the greatest barrier to what God wants to do for me today is what God did for me yesterday. Because I assume He's got to do it the same way. And that's what I'm looking for. If I assume that He has to mimic the way He's always done it. So God you need to use the same songs. God, you need to use the same style of preaching. God, you need to use the same programs of the church. But like manna, it was fresh one day, but it would spoil the next. God loves change. The greatest opposition to what God is doing fresh today comes from those who were on the cutting edge of what God was doing fresh yesterday. That's almost always the case. So the question is, in that which is non-essential, in that which by God's design is meant to be let go of and changed, how are we doing that? Are our wineskins fresh and flexible and new? Are we willing to innovate and risk and venture to offer new, the new wine of the gospel to a new generation in a way that's effective I think virtually everyone who's been a part of this new denomination for any length of time can mark the exact time at which they thought that's the catalyzing moment for the birth of this new denomination. It was in January 2012. It was a talk that was given by John Ortberg. And in that talk, he described the dream of what might happen. And, and he did it in a very winsome kind of a way. He referred to um, Lake Wobegon, you know, the uh, public radio broadcast where there's a, a church in Lake Wobegon and Pastor Inkfest is the pastor of that church and someone is critiquing Pastor Inkfest's sermons and he goes you know what it's like I just don't get it Pastor Inkfest he always says on the way hand this on the way they hand that he never just pounds the pulpit and says the way it is he never puts the hay down where the goats can get at it and then John Orberg said there are churches that know the goats. And there are churches that are seeking to put the hay to where the goats can get at it. If we keep our hay way up too high all the time, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss it. Now, it is true that there are some churches in these changing times, in an effort to try and reach the goats, are, are compromising the hay that they're, they're offering. But not everyone. It's possible 
to hold on to the core of the gospel, but to change the approach in the way that we seek that the gospel should be known. So the fact is that whether we like it or not, there are massive changes that are happening in our day, in our time. Uh, and, and we need to figure out if our hay is working, if we're putting it in a place where others can reach it. There are huge cultural and technological and moral changes that are happening in our day. And we'd better wake up, otherwise we'll be those people who've got a dime and say, hey, I need to make a phone call. Is there a pay phone somewhere? <laughs> is there a pay phone in Idlewild, California? I looked on the internet, it says there is one. Uh, but that might be old. And it'll take more than a dime to make a call in a pay phone today. New ways. New ways. Let's just talk very briefly about some of the changes. I mean, change has changed in our day. The pace of change. Even change has changed. It's no longer slow and incremental. It's dizzying in its velocity. And it has this echoing Yogi Berra who is attributed to say that the future ain't what it used to be. That's true, the pace of change. Secondly, the proliferation of choices. Long gone are the days when there were only three stations that you could choose from and one brand of coffee that you could choose from. I wanted to watch the Super Bowl the other day, and so I went out to Home Depot, got an antenna, and I hooked it up. Guess how many stations I can get for free? Like 140 for free. And you would assume that, living in the fine place of Pine Cove, as we do. Just the proliferation of choices. All of these choices, this explosion of choices, we try to cram way too much in our lives, and the pace of our life, it's just insane. And we're no longer living life, we're just kind of skating over the top of it. The proliferation of cho choices. And then technology. Technology, boy, you would talk about a change. Ours is the day where the world's largest taxi company does not own a car. Uber. The world's largest accommodation provider does not own a room. Airbnb. The world's largest retailer has virtually no brick and mortar stores. You got it. Techn all because of technology. Technology, it's a game changer. Our nation's morality and values are no longer shaped from the pulpit, by what, but rather by what we view on the screen, small or large. Technology. It's been able to add years, uh, years to our life, but not life to our years. And the irony is that we've got unparalleled ways of communicating to each other, but we've never had a more difficult time hearing each other than we do today. So technology has changed. Uh, there's also an increasing moral and relational breakdown. I mean, the number of folks in the divorce courts and prisons and counseling rooms that are bulging. Suicides have never been more in terms of percentage than today. Schools more resemble war zones than they do learning institutions. George Washington, paraf to paraphrase him, morality vaporizes apart from religion. And that brings us to the next change, and that is society's attitude toward religion and Christianity in specific. Our faith, which turned the world upside down in the first century, our faith was spread like wildfire in Europe. Our faith that had an incalculable impact on America's founding and its crucial years is now being relegated to the antiquated and the irrelevant sidelines. I mean, for most millennials, Christianity is not even on the radar not even on the radar. Um, there's a rise of a category when you're asked, uh, do you uh, affiliate with any particular religion? Uh, the last category was always the one N-O-N-E. -E. No, I have none. I don't affiliate with any. That used to be like 4 or 5%. Today, it's 26%. The rise of the nuns, staggering. And many in the media are emboldened to attack Christian values because of this. The courts continue to marginalize the Christian faith. So it's a more difficult time to live out the Christian faith. But I think we make a mistake if we read all of this information from those who are outside of the church and we just stop there because while it's true on one level that folks want to see the church as only a sideshow, 
that it needs to, to remain sleepy and muted, contained and tame and easily dismissed. There's a part of them that wants that. But I earnestly believe at the deeper level, everyone in our society is yearning and has a desire to see a true expression of the Christian faith that is boldly lived out and Christian faith that would take center stage. This whole thing with Kanye West uh, you know, has even Hollywood saying there may be something to it. The possession of a vibrant faith in Jesus Christ and living the life that he offers, that's attractive. If there's a genuine concern for the poor, if you're living out of a, a servant-hearted humility, and if there's a holy boldness that's emanating from a razor-sharp view of who Jesus is and what he's called us to do, that is attractive. Our world that is breathless and exhausted from lives that are unmoored to anything of permanence, they want to know. They want to know. Is there something I can moor my life to that is permanent? And everyone still possesses a trace of the image in which we've been created, the image of God, and there's an echo of the voice of the Creator in everyone's head, and you're wondering amid all of this change, is there an ancient wisdom? Is there absolute truth that is unchanging that I can moor my life to, that's worthy of me giving my best energies to, and my highest devotion, and my most courageous persistence? Can we find, and can we in the church, hold a death grip on what should never change? The gospel of Jesus Christ. But at the same time, be willing to courageously let go of some of the ways that we've used to communicate that gospel. Ways that have lost their effectiveness and their usefulness in a rapidly changing culture and generation. So may we hold firmly onto Jesus Christ, who is unchanging in his love, in his power, in his gospel. And may he lead us to work and to pray in a way that right here, futures are rewritten. And causes are embraced and then lived out. And relationships are purified and they're beautified. And eternal trajectories, they are forever altered. May this be the place. Let's have the courage to express the new wine of the gospel, the new wine of faith, in a real, vibrant, alive, life-changing way, in, in, a, in ways that are new and vibrant and alive and life-changing. What does that look like? I don't even know. Not really. But I know the Holy Spirit does know. And the Holy Spirit is saying, put the beauty of the fullness of the hay down where the goats can get it. The Lord Jesus Christ wants to change your life and mine. He earnestly does. We talked about a whole series of the new that he wants to produce in us. If, if you live out that new, if you lean on Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit to say, okay, a new mind, a new heart, a new hands, new ears, a new, new, new backbone, there's going to be the gospel communicated in a way that's like, wow, can I have some of that? That's what the world will say when the gospel is lived out with authenticity. You up for that? Amen. I think I am. Join me. Join me in prayer. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for parables that remind us that there are some things that are permanent that we, we should always hold on to. May we hold on to your love for us. May we never let that go. May we always hold on to the grace that is able to, to come and to change sin-filled hearts. May we always hold on to the fact that you are yearning to make us into new people, living expressions of the beauty of life that you intended for us originally. Lord Jesus, may we embrace these things, but may we also ask for your Holy Spirit to communicate to us how it is that we should communicate this unchanging truth in a changing culture. 
Lord, may we change our hill. May we change Southern California. May the state of California, which is in desperate need of change and the gospel, hear it from us and see it lived out through us. And that bold prayer we dare to make in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Would you stand and would you conclude as we sing our final